Well, we've talked about the gear and some of the amazing results you can get from digiscoping. Now it's time we look at some of the setups and cover some tips and tricks to help you get the best out of your digiscoping setup. In the first video, we talked about the digiscoping gear available these days from Swarovski. So now, let's talk about the shooting setup and some of those tips and tricks that will help you get better results more quickly. As you can imagine, you shouldn't plan on digiscoping at high magnifications unless you have a good tripod. Beyond that, the load of a digiscope and a camera is a balancing act that most photographers won't really be used to. We may have some experience with longish lenses mounting on a foot plate to balance the lens and balance things out. But that's child's play compared to an 18 inch long scope with a two or three pound camera attached to the eyepiece end. So the center of gravity can change pretty dramatically by adding a camera. Even if you do have a balanced rig, the fact that there's so much weight that's away from the center point means that the slightest touch can add camera shake and camera shake for this kind of rig takes considerably longer to dissipate. So here's my first tip. Do your best to balance your rig as close to the center point as possible. Adding a Swarovski rail adapter can help quite a bit in this process. Tip number two is to experiment with a couple different shooting methods. Single shutter clicks with your hand on the camera will almost always yield bad results. Instead, try shooting in a rapid burst mode. Most of your shots will still be blurred, but you've got a good chance of getting something usable. Another option is to use your camera's built-in timer. This works because it lets the digiscope settle down and stop vibrating before clicking the shutter. This worked for many of the shots I took, but the key is to make sure that you have it set for 5 or 10 seconds, not 2 seconds. Two seconds just isn't enough time for the whole thing to stop moving, and five is probably pushing it. One other option is to use a remote cable release, but you even need to be careful with that because it can cause unwanted vibration by just moving slightly. If your cable's long enough, consider using gaffer's tape to hold the cable against the scope barrel and truly isolate the cable movement from your balanced scope setup. Also, if your camera has a silent mode, be sure to use it so that shutter noise doesn't spook nearby birds or wildlife. Although you may be photographing distant subjects, the shutter sound can easily spook a nearby animal and that can then alert the others. As far as camera settings go, even in bright sunshine, push your ISO to 800 or 1600 or if you have a newer DSLR, go for 3200 to start. That was my experience and that's what you should do according to conventional wisdom because most scopes in most shooting setups generally deliver less light than most traditional camera lenses. But I'm going to add to this idea and suggest that you turn off auto ISO if it's turned on in your camera. There are a couple of reasons for this but we'll get into that in a minute. For now, just pick ISO settings in advance manually. Most digiscoping pros suggest that you use aperture priority so that you can set the widest possible aperture, but that's only possible with point and shoot cameras. Again, because scopes usually deliver less light than what we get from traditional lenses, you'll want to do everything that you can to get as much light as possible into that image sensor. High ISO is the first thing you set. The only thing left is shutter speed. Now here's where it gets tricky you'll generally want a fast shutter speed so that you can freeze action. I'd consider 1 1,000th of a second a good starting shutter speed. And the action you're freezing might just be the movement of your digiscope itself. So your ISO is cranked up and your aperture is as wide as possible. That will allow you to use a relatively fast shutter. Here's the thing about aperture priority. In modern digital cameras, the camera takes light readings and then it adjusts shutter speed to capture what it thinks will be a proper exposure. Starting off, I made the mistake of trying to use aperture priority with my DSLR. I was using a new Nikon D7100 and because the TLS APO is a lens with no aperture control, 
the resulting exposure was wrong. By flipping to full manual and then adjusting the shutter speed, I had success getting good images. If you're comfortable using histograms while reviewing your images to better estimate light levels, you might consider turning them on. I just used the LCD and a loop to adjust my settings until the images were turning out better. Now remember I told you to turn off auto ISO? One key reason for that is because if your camera's automatic systems are delivering an incorrect exposure and you adjust settings to compensate, you don't want that auto ISO adjustment to override what you're trying to do. In the first video, we talked about setting up all the equipment except the DCB2 swing adapter, which is designed to attach a point-and-shoot camera to your scope. While you'll probably figure out that adding the adapter sleeve to the eyepiece is exactly the same as setting up the TLS APO adapter sleeve, there's one more thing that you have to do in order to digiscope with point-and-shoot cameras. You clip the camera to the mounting plate and then adjust it up, down, left, and right and you center the camera lens with the eyepiece lens. Then, position the camera so that you get a hard vignetted circle. Now, make minor adjustments to the mounting position until that vignetted circle is centered in your image area and finally, zoom in a little bit until the vignette is gone and you have a good live image. Depending on your camera, you may not be able to get rid of the vignette entirely. That was the case with my Nikon P7700. To get the best possible results, I left mine zoomed as wide as it would go, and then I manually moved the camera so that it almost kissed the eyepiece. In other words, I did no zooming at all. But you might need to zoom just a little bit depending on the specific camera you're using. There's a chart on the Swarovski website that lists compatible cameras which yield the best possible results. After lots of experimentation, the pros tell us that a good rule of thumb for point and shoots is to get your camera to focus at about three feet away. Depending on which point-and-shoot you're using, this might work best in macro mode. Also, if your point-and-shoot has a manual focus option, you should probably use that as well. Just do a basic manual focus, then use the scope to refine that focus. Finally, if your camera has manual controls, you want to consider using aperture priority or even full manual to get the exposure you want. The key here is that you'll need to experiment quite a bit to see what works best with your particular camera. A couple of other notes about point-and-shoots versus DSLR cameras for digiscoping. Low light, high ISO performance is a major factor in good digiscoping photography. Point-and-shoot cameras simply don't have the low light performance to deliver amazing results like modern DSLRs do. In many shooting scenarios, point-and-shoot cameras can deliver impressive images but with digiscoping, the really impressive images will usually come from a DSLR. I should also mention that currently available TLS APO adapters are optimized for cropped sensors. So you'll see a vignette on a full frame sensor. Just shoot cropped if your camera lets you and everything should be just fine. Let's talk about ball heads and fluid pan heads. If you're using a video fluid pan head, you'll probably find moving your scope is easier than with most traditional still photography ball heads. The Swarovski setup I used wasn't technically a fluid head, even though it may look like one, but because of how it's laid out and where the controls and cam locks are, it's a good solution as well. Whatever you use, one of the first things to do when setting up the tripod is to make sure your center column is as close to straight up and down vertically as possible. Then, before you mount anything, make sure that the mounting surface is level so that any panning you do is perfectly horizontal. This was especially important when shooting things beachfront. Panning accurately across the horizon was a real time saver when reframing shots. Now I want to talk with you about your personal image threshold and your expectations. Forget about digiscoping for just a minute and think about low light photography. We increase the sensor's sensitivity by increasing the ISO number. But that introduces digital noise, and some people call this grain. Higher ISO numbers mean you can shoot in lower light, but you'll have more of that noise or that grain. How much noise you feel is acceptable is really a personal decision. With digiscoping, you'll have factors besides noise that will reduce the quality of your image, and you'll need to decide what's acceptable and what's not. For example, heat waves, dust, wind, 
haze, and shimmer can all affect the focus of your image. On days, usually in the morning, when ground and air temperature are close to one another, shimmer is minimized. Minimal wind and haze will help you capture clear images as well. And while heat waves might be apparent to the naked eye on really hot days, there are times when those heat waves are less dramatic because they're longer stretched out waves. So when you examine your image, it looks like it would if you projected an image on a big screen and then you grabbed the corner of that screen and wobbled it a little bit. Human vision kind of corrects for this, but the camera just can't. So your captured images won't be tack sharp. So if you're the kind of photographer who only wants the most tack sharp images possible, and if noise and atmosphere bothers you at all, you'll need to keep your subjects at around 100 feet away in bright sun. At that point, you'll probably need to consider whether digiscoping is really even for you, but for me, I'm willing to have a little bit of waviness or slightly soft images because I love the idea of reaching out and capturing images of things that are even miles away. When I'm standing on the beach and I see a white dot on the horizon that's about four miles away, I'm thrilled to have what might look like a Cezanne Impressionist painting of a yacht as my image. Or looking at a pine tree that's so far away I can't even tell if there are any birds in the tree, to being able to see an eagle eating a fish it just caught is incredible to me. Don't get me wrong, I love a close-up sharp image of wildlife just like everybody does. I love National Geographic quality images and you can get those with digiscoping. You just can't do it a half a mile away and most days you'll need to be closer than the 50 yard line from your subject. I enjoyed the results I was able to capture at a local wildlife park and these were almost all at 100 feet away or closer. If your local zoo allows tripods, you'll have a blast with a digiscope. So if you're a photography enthusiast who loves photography and experimenting, and if you like the idea of being able to keep digital images of things that you see through a spotting scope, check out the lineup of modular scopes and adapters from the folks at Swarovski. And remember, if you're serious about jumping into digiscoping with both feet, the Swarovski X series models are a good place to start because focusing with a camera adapter attached will be much more seamless. Even though it's not really budget priced gear, it can still perform as well or even better than more expensive options. And finally, if you have any questions about digiscoping or related gear, call a sales professional at B&H or stop by the New York City Superstore. With Swarovski Digiscopes, for B&H and Kelby Training, I'm Larry Becker. Thanks for watching. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.